<clears throat> Should the Bible be taken literally? It's the title of our lesson tonight. At the beginning of 2022, I made a Facebook post asking any of my Facebook friends what type of sermon they might be interested in hearing. I called out specifically to my Facebook friends who are not members of the Church of Christ and asked if you could hear a presentation or a lesson on any Bible topic, what would it be? Uh, do you have any Bible question that you've always wondered about or any question that you've always wanted to answer about our God? If so, in the comment section of Facebook, please leave any top topics or good questions that I could potentially make into a sermon, and I will very likely put it onto my list for 2022. Upload the sermon and then send it out uh, to you privately or tag you. So that was my post on Facebook. Tonight's lesson is in response to one of my friend's requests for a sermon. I'll just read to you his comment and uh, we'll jump right into our lesson for tonight. So would you leave a comment about a Bible question you've always wondered about? I asked, my friend said, sure. I think we can both agree that some parts of the Bible contain allegory to prove a point. By the way, that's an important word for our discussion tonight. The word allegory, it's a literary term, means a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. So he said, I think we can both agree that some parts of the Bible contain allegory to prove a point, such as the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, uh, verses 3 through 9, verses 18 through 23. With this in mind, how do you interpret biblical literalism, uh, which means taking things of the Bible literally? Uh, if a message and meaning is conveyed from a true story or not, why be convinced if it is actually true to prove its moral point? If I wanted to think the entire Bible was an allegory and used it to spread the message of good it contains, why would it matter to others if I believe the story true? So that was my friend's uh, comment and request for a topic. So if, when we break this down, I think that this is actually a very good question to have and a legitimate question for someone to have about the Bible. The sentiment is, how do we know the Bible isn't just a cluster of stories written by men for the purpose of relaying good morals uh, and to spread a good message into this world? Just uh, another man-made masterpiece, a work of literature. How is the Bible any different from any other piece of literature with a moral message? And why must we believe that it's true in order to gain a benefit from it as mankind. You know, in high school and in college, uh, I, I took several literature classes that picked apart various man-made pieces of writing. Uh, many times stories of mythology like uh, the Odyssey or Achilles by Homer. And the teacher would help us to pick apart the themes of these old stories and what the author was trying to contribute toward the betterment of humanity, what he was trying to portray. Upon reading some of these secular works, uh, we as the readers were slightly entertained by the stories, and we learned something about the author's perspective on morals, goodness, or just the meaning of life, or it was just entertainment, whatever their intention was. It was meant to be both thought-provoking and amusing, these stories, which is one of the reasons that men write stories to begin with. So the question is, why is the Bible any different than some of the other works out there? How can we be sure that the Bible wasn't meant to be read like this, like just a book of fiction, for the purpose of spreading a good message throughout the world like other pieces of literature? Why does it have to be a true message, is the question. And the short answer that we would give in the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church, for which we will discuss for the rest of this lesson, is that although the Bible was written by the hands of men, like other works were written by the hands of men, the Bible, we believe, was in fact a message inspired of God, unlike any literature that has ever been produced. The Bible is, we believe, a stand-alone work because of the writing preserved in it is truly not the work of man. We believe it is the work of God, as do so many others. 
the Bible itself claims, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Samuel 23, verse 2, David says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So did man write down the scripture? Yes. But does the Bible claim that they came up with the writing themselves? No, it doesn't. So the idea is that God was involved from start to finish in its construction. And the writing down of these stories, these messages. So I have three points for you tonight. Point number one, I want to answer the question, how do we know the entire Bible isn't a parable? If Jesus presented stories as a teaching tool, right? You look at some of the parables, you don't assume that all those were true, but you just portray a story to relay a theme or a moral lesson to his audience. Is the whole Bible, the Bible as a whole, perhaps the same thing? Just a series of untrue stories with made-up characters simply to teach a moral lesson? That's the question. So sub-point letter A, as we go through this outline, answering this first question. I think this is an important principle to bring out. First, the Bible itself doesn't claim to be a parable. And reading it as fiction was not the intention of the authors. Unlike the works of Homer, the Greek poet, or Shakespeare, the English playwright, the Bible authors spoke of its main characters and its events as being real people and its events as being 100% true. That's the tone of the whole Bible, that this is not a made-up story, not a fairy tale. In the secular world, I do not believe men like Shakespeare or Homer or Sophocles actually expected their audience to believe these stories were true, but that they were surely intended as mythology, full uh, fun stories with a message to the reader. The Bible, on the other hand, is written with bold claims of truth and actuality. More like a book of history and instruction than a book of fairy tales. Take, for example, the writings of the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 1, who said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, who is Jesus Christ. So what is that to say? I was with Jesus Christ, actually myself and the other apostles who knew him we saw him with our own eyes we heard him with our own ears and we touched him with our own hands i deliver you this information as an eyewitness of these events i am not making this up is the claim of the authors so it's not presented as a parable in first or in john chapter 21 and verse 24 john ends his gospel by saying about himself this is the disciple talking about himself who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. I'm talking about his own testimony. So my question is, was John's intention to make up stories that didn't happen using characters who didn't exist? The answer is no. John's claim is that this really happened to me. And uh, what I witnessed firsthand, far different from the tone of Homer or Shakespeare who made up their stories. All the Bible writers were guided by God to ensure to their readers that they knew that these writings were not just fairy tales. Uh, you see it all throughout the Bible. For example, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, the Apostle Paul said, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Countless times you'll read the Bible writers saying, God gave me this instruction. Or God commanded me this. Or thus saith the Lord, right? In fact, the Bible has more thus saith the Lord than any other piece of literature claiming to be written by God. Right? There are only a handful of books that exist that even claim to be written by God or the, an, an inspired book. But the Bible is in a category all its own, jam-packed from front to back with these claims of inspiration. The writer said, God spoke these words and told me what to write. It's all through the Bible. It's also important to know that most of the Bible writers were severely persecuted or killed for the things that they wrote about and preached. 
The Apostle John, as we mentioned moments ago, said uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, that he was exiled on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That means he was banished to a secluded island because he would not stop preaching this message that was circulating in the first century. The Apostle Paul is another great example. Uh, was put to death. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. History tells us uh, that Peter would be another one who was put to death, crucified upside down, the story goes. Not written in scripture, but elsewhere. In fact, if you look, all 12 of the apostles, except for John, who was exiled, suffered the most excruciating deaths. Why? Because they wouldn't stop preaching this message that they believed. I think this is a good question. Do you suppose if a government had grabbed a hold of some of these secular writers we've been talking about, like Homer or William Shakespeare, and said, admit that your writings are just made up stories or be put to death? Do you suppose that these men would have had any trouble admitting to that to save their lives? I don't think so. All right, Shakespeare, if you don't confess that Romeo and Juliet were made up people, that will put you to death. Shakespeare would have said, of course they're made up people. Right? That was the intention. I intended this just to be a story. It was just literature and fiction. Well, the Bible writers, on the other hand, died in the most horrific ways, not willing to budge about their message being true. It does not read as fiction, they wrote it down intending for it to be taken as a, a true story, and they went to their graves believing that their writings were fact, not fiction. Which brings us to cell point number two. All outside evidence points to the fact that the Bible characters really existed and that the Bible events really happened. Now, by outside evidence, I mean secular sources, not biblical ones. Not just the Bible talking about itself, but other sources talking about the things that happen. First and foremost, the Bible has complete historical accuracy. Secular documentation that is separate from the biblical text points to the fact that these were real people, real nations, and real events that actually happened on the face of the earth. No Bible story has ever proved to be historically inaccurate. Secular history tells us that men like Pontius Pilate actually existed. This was not a made-up character of fiction in order, or who ordered the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Secular history shows us that Pilate was, in fact, the Roman governor of Judea from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36, meshing perfectly with the time frame that the Bible talks about. We also see that the line of Herod in uh, the New Testament meshes perfectly with secular history. From the Herod who ordered the death of the babies in Bethlehem, to the Herod present at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, to the Herod eaten of worms in Acts chapter 12, we can also read in secular history about the line of Herod's and the family. These characters were not made up. History also cannot deny that the Christian religion started in Jerusalem near AD 33 as an offshoot of Judaism, just like the Bible says. And that's what history tells us. Other sources say that this is when this happened. If we go back even further, men like Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament really existed according to secular history. And not only did he exist, but he also existed just when the Bible said he existed. One website said, as one of the more famous kings of ancient Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar ruled for over 40 years from about 605 B.C. to 562 B.C. That's the precise time frame that lines up with Scripture. Also, men like Cyrus, king of Persia, really existed. Secular history shows us that, who allowed uh, the Hebrew people to return to Jerusalem after their captivity. Another interesting one is that of the Hittite nation in the Old Testament. For years, those in the fields of geology and archaeology mocked at this non-existent nation that the Old Testament talks so much about. So there's no Hittite nation. There's no evidence of that. But to the skeptic's surprise, archaeologists in 1880 dug up bountiful evidence of just such a nation called the Hittites, dating back to the exact time frame that the Bible was talking about. So the Bible was right. 
So no, there has never been an archaeological discovery or a piece of writing in secular history that in any way conflicts with the Bible stories or events to contradict them. The Bible is historically accurate, helping us to understand that the characters were real people and the events actually happened. Next, the Bible is also uh, geographically accurate. Of the hundreds of references to places and directions relating to one another, for example, then they traveled east to such and such a place, or north or west, or they traveled down in elevation from Jerusalem to another place. The Bible is 100% accurate in all of its ge geographical references and directions in Scripture giving us evidence that all 40 writers were not intending to make up fictional stories, but they were actually writing down events that actually happened in the Bible land. Thirdly, the Bible has scientific accuracy. I think of or, uh, Psalm chapter 8 and verse 8. It talks about the paths in the sea, which men found later to be true when they found ocean currents. And one of the fathers of, ocean, or of that, that line of work was using this to go and look and say, I, I know that this says it's in there. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22 references the earth as a circle. Quote, it is, it is God who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. So this was years before any human sent anything up into outer space and the entire scientific community at the time claimed that the earth was flat. But God inspired Isaiah to write something he could not have otherwise known. The earth was actually a circle. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 gives another scientifically accurate statement that mankind would not figure out for another 1,000 years. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Many ignorant medical practices such as bloodletting where they would basically drain the blood out of a human when they get sick and they wonder why the people died was a common practice before the 1900s when modern science finally discovered in the 1900s that the life of any flesh really is found in the blood. And you can't drain the blood or you're going to kill the life of the flesh. You see, the scientific foreknowledge of Scripture is one thing to help prove the Bible's inspiration of God. Otherwise, how could its writers have known thousands of years before modern science would discover the pass of the sea, that the earth was a circle, and that life, the life of the flesh was in the blood? Only to name a few. Fourth, we could spend a long time talking about how the Bible is prophetically accurate. Right? We could talk about how the Bible writers prophesied about the Israelite nation being taken into the Babylonian captivity that would last precisely 70 years. And they it foretold about it years before it happened. Jeremiah 25 and verse 11, the writing that legitimately dates back to before the 70-year Babylonian captivity foretold and said, And this whole land shall be a desolation and, and astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, how long? Seventy years. Just the way it ended up happening. Isaiah even wrote by inspiration of God about the Persian ruler that we talked about earlier, King Cyrus, who would be responsible for allowing Israel to come out of the Babylonian captivity, and it lists him by name several decades before he was even born. Isaiah 44, 28, Isaiah 45, verse 1. We could also talk about how Genesis, uh, the first book of the Bible, foretold about a descendant who would come from Abraham who would bring about a blessing to the whole world, Genesis 22, and verse 18, talking about Jesus Christ. 4,000 years before Jesus would come, this promise was given. Only 700 years before Christ would come, Isaiah said that God would give the world a sign by sending a Savior born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This wasn't just some just concoction of the first century. This was written 700 years beforehand. So you see, when individuals dive in deep and study the claims of the Bible, they'll realize that it is not like any book out there of human origin. The 40 Bible writers living hundreds of years apart from each other did not have a chance to sit around a round table together and discuss how this story would unfold. Many of them didn't know each other. Many of them didn't live in the same place. Some of them lived a thousand years apart in time. And yet this story meshes as if 40 men sat around a round table. And all these documents date 
to the precise dates that they claim to be written. So the Bible alone can convince you, if you study it, that it is the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It will convince you is the Bible's claim. For years, the Bible has been the best-selling book in all the world. More copies of the Bible are printed off and distributed than any other book that has ever existed. And why is that? Is it because its readers simply believe that this is a book of fiction or a book of fairy tales? The answer is no. It's because worldwide its readers are convinced of its divine origin. And that's why it's such a popular book and the most popular book. Not many people just go out and read this book as fiction or for fun. Some do. But most read this book in an effort to pursue their heavenly creator because they believe it was written by him. Jesus himself said that this word would spread into all the world like a sower who sows his seed into the ground. Behold, a sower went out to sow his seed, which is the word of God. Some of the seed fell on the ground, and when it did, it didn't have time to do its job because the birds came and they took the seed away instantly before it could penetrate into the soil. Jesus explained that the seed is the word of God and that the devil is the one who can take away the word before it actually can work on the hearts of men. One of the fables... The, one of the devil's favorite tactics. The devil craftily makes sure that the word of God is taken away before it can penetrate the hearts of sinners. And I believe one of the ways the devil does this is by convincing people that the word really did not come from God. And the word can't hit your heart the proper way if you think it was just a concoction of man. The devil tricks men today into thinking that the events written in the word are just made up stories for our entertainment and not true occurrences that happen and really happen between God and man. He wants us not to believe it truly happened. So how do we know the entire Bible isn't just a parable? Well, A, we've noted that the Bible itself doesn't claim to be a parable. B, all outside evidence points to the fact that the Bible characters really existed and the Bible events really happened. And now number three, or C, I want you to think about this. Why would we count any Bible event to be impossible when an all-powerful God is in this picture? I think that's one of the main questions here, isn't it? Many times I believe people count the Bible as a fairy tale book because some of the events, many of the, the events, seem like something that could only happen in a fairy tale. Jesus walking on water, a dead person being raised back to life again, Bread falling from the sky, from heaven, and uh, able to feed the whole nation of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. The ten plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea. So, right, That kind of stuff doesn't happen in real life, does it? Many people look at these events and say, yeah, that's something that happens in Greek mythology, those kinds of stories, and those are urban legends. They don't really, that stuff doesn't happen in this world. But when we realize that the Bible authors did not intend to entertain us with these stories, that wasn't their intention, they didn't care if we were entertained, but it was to convince us that these stories were true, maybe we should consider the possibility that these miracle events actually and literally happen, because that's their claim. Because what we're dealing with is the claim that an all-powerful God is in this picture. The claim is that an almighty, the almighty, actually and literally performed these feats as a means of convincing mankind of his message. He performed the science to convince us and to have these things written down. And why is such a claim absurd when God is in the picture? God, I believe, appeals to our intellect and our honesty. As we consider how life could possibly exist without something supernatural happening at the very beginning to start it. Right, have you ever thought about that before? Whether a person wants to go with the Big Bang, the scientists are all saying today, or the mighty creation story, the true Big Bang that happened in six literal days, both models start with something that goes against the laws of nature. And no, science, no scientist can explain it with the laws of nature. We, we all agree on this point. If you go back with me to the very beginning of our universe, think about a time when there was nothing living 
in the material universe. Better yet, there was no material universe. Two thoughts I want you just to think about. Number one, if there ever was a time when, it, when the material universe did not exist, then how did it get here? You know, Julie Andrews put it well in her song. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. Number two, if there ever was a time when life didn't exist, then where did it come from? Because the scientific law of biogenesis states that life only comes from life that came before it. So if there was ever a time when there was not life, what would we have scientifically? What would we have now? No life. How did the first life start in the physical universe? Scientists can't answer the question. They, think, they, they try to give, oh, well, here's our theory of how it happened. Scientists can't answer the question. Because scientifically, it is a contradiction of nature. With whatever model you go with, it's a contradiction of the natural laws. So it does not fit within the natural laws. Life can't exist unless it came from life before it. And atheists will object and they'll say, then if you're saying that it, uh, it came from God, then who created God? If this principle is consistent, the answer is simple. Nobody created God. Right? The idea with a God is that he exists in opposition to the way that the natural laws work that we see and know today. We might add because he created the natural laws. Poor Josie. <laughs> So we understand that uh, somewhere at the very beginning, if you go back to the beginning of time, the natural laws acted unnaturally. Something outside of nature, you might call it super nature, supernatural, caused the material universe to come into existence and more life to be generated from the life of God. So either way you look at it, something acted against nature at the very beginning. Even scientists believe that true. Something had to act outside of the natural causes. So you see, I believe these are the questions that are truly holding people up from wanting to read the Bible as a literal story and not a fairy tale book. This is what's holding them up right here. They say, well, something supernatural just happened in this story. Then it can't be serious. Well, why not? This cluster of events is claiming to be God's interactions with man in times past, so why put up a red flag when we read about the supernatural? So here's the question is, would, not, would you not expect a book inspired by God to include supernatural events? And that's exactly what the Bible contains. So why must we conclude that it's a fairy tale? So number, number three on this outline, why would we count any Bible event to be impossible when an all-powerful God is in the picture? All right, number four, or letter D, let's ask this question. If humans can understand figures of speech in their own books, then why can't God use some figures of speech in his book? Are figures of speech and parables often used with some of the Bible stories and the teaching lessons in Scripture? Sure they are. Uh, parables and metaphorical language, that's used a lot. But if we stop and think about it, the notion is actually really silly to consider that just because a book sometimes uses figures of speech, then the entire book must suddenly be incapable of holding any literal value. Right? For example, if my dad came up to me uh, back in high school before I had a track race and said, break a leg, tra Travis, break a leg, which is what? A figure of speech. Would I suddenly be convinced that everything that my dad ever has to say to me is a figure of speech just because he used one? Would one figure of speech suddenly throw me off on everything else that my dad ever says? The answer is no, because we as humans know how to decipher when figures of speech are being used and when someone is actually talking plainly. We can tell the difference, can't we? I remember how in John chapter 16, Jesus had been talking for a lengthy amount of time in chapters 12 through 16, and he kept talking, you might say, in code, to his disciples using parables and figures of speech and figurative language. But you'll notice in John chapter 16, verse 29, his apostles notice that Jesus stops using figures of speech and he starts talking to them plainly. And I suppose you could say he stops talking in code. 
and talks normal and listen to what the disciples declare. They say, see, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Did you catch that? His followers caught the distinction. They understood when he stopped using figures of speech and when he started using plain language. Now, I think we have to realize that our God is smart enough to relay both literal thoughts and figurative thoughts to which he knows we'll be able to understand the difference. You know, in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 6, when David expressed his guilt by saying, For I am a worm and no man. God knew that human beings would not be confused to think that David was saying he was literally a worm. Right? God was smart enough to know that we had the capability as humans of distinguishing when figures of speech were actually used versus literal language. Acts chapter 12 and verse 23 is an example of when a worm is referenced in the literal sense, we believe in Scripture. The text says, Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck Herod because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. God wanted to convey a message that Herod was struck with literal <laughs> worms inside him, so that he died. And we can distinguish the difference. So how can we understand when figures of speech are being used in the Bible versus literal language? How do we do it? I'd say the answer is just use honesty with the text and common sense. As 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're capable of that. I might add that many of the times when figures of speech are used in Scripture, the Scripture will come out and tell us that figures of speech are being used in Scripture as opposed to literal language. In the parables of Jesus, the text tells us that he often taught using parables with the people. So we should be ready for it when Jesus is speaking, when we're reading about Jesus speaking before the people. He uses parables. He does it all the time. So you should expect it. Many times the text says, and he spoke a parable unto them. So we know that he is transitioning from plain language to figurative language. The book of Revelation is another great example. It is a book that describes itself as a book filled with figures of speech and symbols. It's different from books like Matthew or Genesis, book of Acts or 1 Corinthians. Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 Jesus told John about the visions being shown to him, and he said, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. What did he mean? These visions that Jesus is showing John were pictures representing, number one, current circumstances that were taking place on the earth at the time, and number two, things that would be taking place after that point. That's the whole book of Revelation in two points. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1, halfway through the book of signs, John said, Then I saw another sign in heaven. So what's funny about the book of Revelation is that it comes out and it says, This is a book that's filled with signs, symbols, and figures of speech. And yet everyone in the religious world seems to take it literally. Have you ever noticed that? Bible passages that were clearly meant to be figurative and symbolic, they take literally. Passages that were clearly meant to be literal, they take figuratively. That's not rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says, God is not the author of confusion. Our God knew that he could convey a message to us that would be understood by his readers. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul said about the scripture, he says, By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. The Bible can be understood. We can understand when figurative language is being used and when it's literal. Because the text, for the most part, are very plain. Oftentimes people want to, uh, people want to take literal passages figuratively. Why? Because they don't like the messages very much if you take them literally. Oh, you think that mankind is literally going to stand before a judgment seat of God, of Christ, when this life is all over, that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. You think that's real? Do you think that this is there's a literal heaven, a literal hell? 
where men will suffer and other men will go to be rewarded, Matthew 25, 46? And the answer is, yes, we believe that. Unless the text compels us to take something figuratively, or it shows us, I believe we should take it at its face value. Now, in certain books of the Bible that clarify up front that they are written entirely in signs, such as the book of Revelation or Ezekiel, I think it's actually the opposite mentality, where take it figuratively unless you're forced to take it literally. But yes, I believe when we study the Bible as a whole, it compels us to take it literally at face value, if we're being honest with what the text says. Number two, as we close this lesson, number one, we talked about how can we be sure that the Bible isn't just a parable, the whole Bible. Number two, let's end on this point. The Bible was not written merely to spread a message of goodness across the world, but to teach men about the true God and to make heaven available. That's why the Bible was actually written. You know, in, in delivering the Bible, although it was part of the reason, God was not only trying to get humans to treat each other well, right? that was not the end goal. The end goal and the great benefit of the Bible is not simply for this world to be a better place, although that's one of the byproducts of the Word of God. No, the end goal and the great benefit of the Bible is to invite souls who are willing to come to the next world, which is heaven, to be with God, which is a far greater existence than the one that we know now, that's the end goal. And those who don't want any part with God will go to a literal place called hell, and the righteous will go to a literal place called heaven. That's what the Bible says. And the reason the Bible must be taken literally is because these types of facts that we've talked about tonight are painted as entirely true and not fairy tales. Number one, there is a God in heaven who created mankind. Not figuratively, not metaphorically, but literally. This God is how humanity came to be, how we got here on this earth. And he has communicated for us the gospel for how we can go to heaven and be with him. So the creator communicated to us. Number two, inside our bodies, Rest an immortal spirit that will exist forever and eternity. Right, we were made in the image of God, an eternal being. And we will continue to exist because that's the way God made us. Our spirits will continue to exist. Number three, we need to understand this is not figurative. There is a literal enemy in the spirit realm known as Satan. And number four, Satan's goal is to try to make you miss out on heaven to end up in hell, away from God, forever. You can't take these figuratively. All right, these concepts are entirely true, not urban legends. Why must the Bible be taken literally? Because getting to enter into heaven with God is dependent upon us believing what God told us is true. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You cannot get to heaven without believing these things to be true. So even if we follow morality and we spread a message of goodness into this world, we cannot receive the benefit from it, the true benefit from it, if we don't actually believe it's true. That's why it matters that we believe it's true. So why do I care if somebody reads this Bible and doesn't believe that it's true? Why do I care? Simple answer is because I don't want one single soul to miss out on heaven. Furthermore, I don't want one single soul to end up in a place called hell. Why would we want that for our fellow humans? If you talk about spreading a message of goodness, that's the message of goodness. And if you don't believe it's true, it's not going to work. So we desperately want mortal men to realize that this is a 100% true message and not a fairy tale in any sense of the word. The Bible is relaying the truth. So that's our lesson for this evening. Uh, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to obey the plan of salvation, which is uh, five simple steps by hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting, confessing, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have any questions about that, I would be happy to sit down and study with you. Um, and if anybody needs to come from the church, needs prayers or repentance, 
please uh, come as we stand and sing. Have a seat on the front row. My Jesus and-